So today you're going to meet a world-class expert who's going to share some small strategies that will make a big impact on student learning. So during our time together, we're going to focus on supporting early literacy with expert Dr. Adria Klein. Uh, Dr. Klein will share three strategies, and for each of those strategies, we are going to send you with brand new Seesaw lessons, which are ready-to-go activities right in Seesaw that you can use in your classroom tomorrow um, to support these strategies. So a couple of housekeeping items just before we begin. This session is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be shared in a follow-up email. Give us 24 to 48 hours to get you that email um, after the session is complete. If you have questions during this session, we would love to answer them for you. We have some people in our back channel that are super excited to answer those questions. And if it's in a question um, that's appropriate for Dr. Klein, we will make sure that we give her some time to answer that as well. Those questions should go in the Q&A. Um, when you put them in the Q&A, it ensures that we won't miss them. And it also allows us to see which questions were answered. And if any questions go unanswered during this time, we can reach out to you with the answers after this webinar is concluded. Um, other comments or ideas, uh, reactions can be put in the chat so that all participants can view them. So to start, uh, my name is Tracy Purdy, and I am the Training and Professional Development Manager here at Seesaw. Um, I'm a former fourth grade and sixth grade teacher, so I have had um, a lot to learn from Dr. Klein during this time that we've been working with her um, about early literacy. I'm very excited to be joining with you today. I am joining you from the Minneapolis area, and I'm here with my uh, colleague, Mia. I'll turn it over to her to introduce herself. Hello, everyone. My name is Mia. I am the Training and Professional Development Specialist here at Seesaw. I'm so excited to be here with you as well. I am a former kindergarten teacher, so early literacy is a passion of mine, so I'm so excited for Dr. Klein to share all of these amazing strategies with you, and I am based in the Chicago area. Fantastic. And now let's meet our expert. Uh, Dr. Adria Klein is the trainer and director of comprehensive literacy of the Comprehensive Literacy Center at St. Mary's College of California and Professor Emerita of Reading Education at CSU San Bernardino, where she was the chair of the Department of Elementary and Bilingual Education. A former president of the California Reading Association, Association she also served on the International Literary Association Board of Directors. She earned her PhD at the University of New Mexico in reading and ESL. Dr. Klein is the co-author of many professional books and articles on reading intervention, multi-literacy learning, and early mathematics instruction. She obviously has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with us today, and we are so excited to have you. Uh, welcome, Dr. Klein. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here talking about early literacy. When we think about strategies in young children, there's so many factors that we can work on. We can work on what we call items, and we can work on strategies, and we have to work on both. So bringing that together, our goal is to talk about early literacy strategies that impact learning. I'm delighted to be partnering with Seesaw in their efforts to bring early literacy to teachers, to families around the world. And that's going to be our focus and what I hope will be a, a busy but flying by time together. Because from all the places you say you are, I know time zones quite well. That's part of my early math. And I realize how many different times of day and tomorrow many of you are in right now. So thank you for joining us. As we think about early literacy, uh, put together an idea about what the brain does when we read. And so many people are talking about brain research and neuroscience, and they're saying this side of the brain lights up or that side of the brain lights up when we read. Actually, both sides of the brain light up. And when we think about that brain lighting up, sometimes they're thinking about words and sounds and how they sound from oral language but that is foundational, that early talk that has maybe not been as possible in the last few years of the different types of constraints we've had on being together. But talking with our children, allowing them time to interact, time to talk, time even in my third grade last year was in breakout rooms. And from the idea that I trusted the children as I helped them with anchor charts, 
to understand how what they talked about was foundational to what they read. This is true in preschool where I taught in Los Angeles. And so when we think about the speaker and listener, as I said, both sides of the brain are lighting up. Let's think about speaking and listening and consider that's the early neural networks that form in our brain. Young children cry a bit, they're hungry, they're tired, they want to eat, they need a diaper change. And the speaker, the young child, is with sounds about what's and needs. And then the listener, the caregiver, the parent, the teacher is helping to support that. That builds the early networks that keeps growing as children are speaking and listening to each other. So one thing we always did in preschool and early literacy was allow the opportunity for play and talk to go on. I think about early writing and how oftentimes we say as an adult, I like it quiet right now. But from the standpoint of where we are, the talk that accompanies writing in the classroom is really helpful. So we'll pause on this slide just a minute and think about what makes talk visible. In any language, in any symbol system, even with languages that were not written down but only transliterated more recently, what we're doing when we talk and then work in reading and writing is we're mapping our language onto the printed page. As Mari Clay from New Zealand said, we're making talk visible in the symbols, letters that are on the page. So early sound learning, early literacy learning is really about that talk they've been surrounded by hopefully in family and caregiver and community and preschool and early K that now has to be mapped onto the page. We know from the research that the less opportunity to talk is clearly tied some to many children's difficulty in early literacy development. And so that is the idea that talk, as simple as we say, talk written down, as many Van Allen said, reading is talk written down, a very old phrase from an Arizona researcher to think about mapping our language onto the printed page, making talk visible. And there's delight as my, sec my grandson said, when he was only two, we were walking where he lives in Northern California and we were on our way to a restaurant. And he went, grandma, there's my name. And I looked up at the restaurant name and I knew it wasn't his name, but it started with an M and his name starts with an M. And he knew the sound of M because he'd been called by his name so many times. And I said, yes, Max, there's your M. And that's how he, sure he didn't have the whole word, sure he didn't know all the letters, he didn't even know the letter name, but he began to be familiar with it from oral language, and then he saw the printed symbol that's making talk visible. And so then when we think about what we need to do, it isn't just the talk, it isn't just making print visible, but that whole convention of print, whether it's top to bottom in Korean and Japanese, if it's left to right, if it's right to left, if there's spaces between words. I had the privilege of teaching in Hungary, for example. My Hungarian is extremely limited, but from the standpoint that adjectives and adverbs are added on to the end of words, and that makes some words 28 letters long without a space in them. When you think about that and you go, oh my goodness, but because of print concepts, thinking about the nature of directionality, return sweeps, the use of punctuation, all of that is part of being aware of print. So one of the problems is sometimes too much isolation work on letters and sounds and words without the idea of movement, even across a single word, limits some of the application of concepts about print as we read. So it all has to happen at once. It's amazing that it happens. So we're going to think about three strategies, three steps, and as we consider where we're moving to next and all the ideas, let's get started with those. I pull a page from Simon Sinek, and many of you know of his work in business and community leadership. Knowing our why is at the center of the theory and research I've been talking about for these first few minutes. Knowing our how is what we as educators, as caregivers, as parents, as families, as community folks, knowing what to do and with what 
So it all comes together. The why has to be at the center. It looks like a bit of a yolk of an egg, if you want to think about it. It's where everything grows. And then as it spreads out, we need to know more about our high, how and our why. It works in business and colleagues and friends. It works in learning to read, knowing your why, understanding how to do it, and then finding the best resources. Your what is part of the teamwork we do. So one of three ideas I want to put in there is the importance of spaced repetition. And repetition can have choice, whether that's which book do you want to read first, not which book do you want to read, is the idea of choice but repetition. And so the brain research tells us again that early learning needs some choice brought into it. That idea of only going in one path through the repetition Make it a big letter M, make it a small letter M, draw it in crayon, make the color variation. That whole idea of repetition with early learning, with choice, is part of that consideration. All of us repeat. We go into a room and we remind ourselves why we went into that room. Or at least I've been teaching long enough to try and remember which book was I going for as I immediately find another book I wanna get and another book and it's like, don't leave the room without the book you came in here for. It's the idea of I need repetition, but I need some choice. So I'm using an adult humor example to talk about giving children, we're going to read these two books, do these two word learning activities, but there could be flexibility and interchangeability that makes a child feel they have agency and empowerment. So what happens is things are in short-term memory and we all know about the working memory and the short-term memory, but to go to long-term memory, the research of the early learners says to us, they need seven to 10 repetitions spaced, but in close proximity. So that concept is, we can know it today, you heard the old adage, in one ear and out the other. That is not what we're talking about, and that is not true. But the idea that if we space the repetition and do it again, more times, with fun, with enjoyment, how many times do you think I kept referring to the M from Max's name? So the old idea of one and done. We've done it once. I taught that. It's done. But the cognitive concept we're talking about means we have to come back to revisit it over time. But why choice? What is for building cognition? Choice is what's build memory, agency, ownership. So if we only have repetition, but we don't have a degree of choice. Now, I used to say to my colleagues at the university, we're still talking forced choice. We know the parameters of what we want to teach today, but it's possible there could be a little bit of flexibility, which says, as a learner, I control some of my own learning, but I need to do it all, but it can vary. And that's one thing that we've been talking about a lot in this work, one and done, but the cognitive concept is revisit over time and choice makes it memorable. I repeat it on purpose. I said it at the beginning, I gave an example, then I gave a repetition. It will stick differently. It will go deeper. It'll go from working memory to long-term memory more often that way. Simple example. So what do we do? What are ways to implement? And think about this in regard to alphabet charts. We have many different versions in classrooms. The possibility of some games, listening with ears and looking with eyes. You know those big glasses that children love to do. And if you're old enough to remember uh, Ding Dong School and Miss Francis, she had a magnifying glass. I have never gotten children to look more closely at something than just having a glass in a little frame, which isn't magnified, but they go, oh my gosh, I'm listening and I'm looking. That's both sides of the brain adding now, making the print visible. It comes together in a very logical way. I didn't say much about games with repeating sounds, but that actually takes us to the concept I've been talking about, which is long-term memory and not just one and done, but we listen with our ears and we look with our eyes. 
we often say, as Mari Clay said, to the ear, to the mouth, to the eye, to the hand. How do we repeat in many ways throughout the day, make it fun, but have opportunity for choice? Those are big ideas I've been talking about. So when I say fun practice, I'm not talking fluff. I'm talking serious focus, but with a lighthearted, different voices in the room, ping-ponging across the room, repeating again for fluency. So when we decode, which is essential to teach and stress, we aren't done. I like to say in a rhyming fashion, we've just begun, but much more has to be done. So while that's a rhyme, in a bad way, I have to admit, People would say, you're not a poet. But from that standpoint, when I wrote that, I was thinking the idea is those sounds repeat, but they don't all look alike. Spelling and sounding may not match. That's part of what we have to expose kids to, back to the first idea, making print visible. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein. Yeah, to you, my friend. Yeah, so let's talk about those fun ways to practice um, within Seesaw. So Seesaw now offers, um, as Tracy mentioned earlier, a subscription of standard aligned ready to teach lessons that support students with skills that they absolutely need the most. Our fun phonemes lessons collections was built to support phonemic awareness. So um, earlier, Dr. Klein emphasized the importance of that spaced repetition of sounds in order to build long-term memory of those sounds. With fun phonemes, each lesson is designed to give students that repeated practice to hear, to interact with, and to practice the sounds in the English language. We know that children's speech sounds develop as soon as they utter their first babbles as babies, while a Acquiring uh, the sounds vary from child to, child to child. Research does show that there is a predictable pattern to which they are able to produce sounds according to their age. And um, our activities were created to follow this pattern. Fun phonemes is completely focused on sound. So it's all um, phonemic, all audio, and each activity includes ways for the child to see the sound in many different ways. So now I'm gonna actually jump into a fun phonemes lesson. So here I am into um, in my Seesaw journal. The Fun Phonemes collection is available for all teachers. We're excited to share with you beginning this week as a part of our teacher preview um, in our activities library tab. So you'll notice um, within the next few days that you'll have um, access to this amazing collection in your activity library. So let me show you how to get there. So I am going to begin by tapping that green add button going to assign activity. And now you see I'm in my activity library. I'm going to click on that tab that you see that says Seesaw Lessons. There's a little new shiny new icon next to that. You will see that appear in your library shortly. So here I am in the lessons library. So this is where you will have a preview of these four collections. You'll have access to all the lessons within um, these collections, but we're going to take a look at fun phonemes. So I'm going to click on fun phonemes. And we're actually going to explore the letter I lesson. So I'm going to scroll down to find that letter I lesson. And with these Seesaw lessons, you do have the ability to assign them directly from the library. You don't have to save them to your personal library. So I'm going to go ahead and click assign. I am going to select the class like I would normally do. And I am going to go ahead and assign that to my students. And um, when students respond to a Seesaw activity, they're gonna see that activity show up in their activity library and all they have to do is click add response. So I am gonna um, submit a response on behalf of the sample student so that we can pop into this fun phonemes lesson for the letter I and you can see what it looks like from a student um, viewpoint. So students begin here on the clickable homepage, which takes them on this journey to explore that letter I sound. So they begin here by clicking that link where it says start. 
And they will begin that journey by watching an instructional video with Teacher Barnes and her buddy Soundhound. So I'm gonna play um, the video for you. And as you watch this video, I want you to notice how Teacher Barnes and Soundhound are really intentional about um, enunciating clearly and visually showing students how to make the sound. And this is also um, really great to support students in learning how to form their mouth to make the sound, especially now now when our students have one mask and they can't see us actually articulate and make those sounds with our mouth. Um, so in the video, um, as we watch, um, you'll notice that the sound is repeated over and over again to support that strategy that Dr. Klein mentioned of spaced repetition. So let's take a look. Welcome. Today is the a sound party. Come join me. Hi, Teacher Barnes. Oh, hi, Soundhound. Uh, Teacher Barnes. Yes. You got a you got milk on your lip. Oh my goodness, milk on my lip. I took a sip of milk and now I have it on my lip. Better wipe it off before the party begins. The milk is off my lip. Now I'm ready. Are you ready, sound out? <laughs> Let's make the I sound. First, I keep my tongue lifted up to my top teeth as I slightly open my mouth and say I. I. Now you try. Mm. I. You've got it. Listen to these words with the I sound. I, bib. I, dish. I, six. Now you try. Mm. I, zip. Right, so I just wanted to play a little bit of that video so you can get an idea of what students will see. So after they watch that video on how to make the I sound, you'll notice that um, there are these kid-friendly navigation buttons. So they're just gonna click on that arrow and that's going to take them to the next page. On every page, there are directions in English and in Spanish that explain for students um, what to do. And then the content is all um, in audio. So either a video or an audio. So um, students will nav navigate throughout um, this lesson and they will listen to the sound multiple times. Um, they will actually um, have opportunities to um, circle the cloud that makes the I sound and record themselves saying the I sound as they navigate, they get to sort images that make that sound. So they have that repeated practice of engaging with um, that I sound. And at the end um, of the lesson, after they go through that journey, um, there is a connection activity um, that can be completed at home specifically with a family member or with a friend that brings families into the learning. But you'll notice that there are multiple activities that students engage with in multidimensional ways. This is meant for students to be com uh, to complete over the course of multiple days. So you can assign this for a center activity. I saw a question in the chat about um, how you um, you still how you differentiate for those students that are progressing or at advance and those students that still need more support. This is a way that you can differentiate. You can assign these lessons just for that student those students that need that support, they have everything within the lesson to interact independently. You see, they have the draft button. They can save that um, as a draft and they can come back to it each day. So that is um, that letter I activity. 
So we do have for you three fun cloning lessons to share with you today. Um, these lessons include a short I lesson, an NG lesson, and a long E lesson. Um, but remember, as a part of our new teacher preview, you will have access to the entire collection in your activity library. Um, like uh, the demo that I showed you, all of the lessons allow students that repeated practice with the sound in multiple ways. And we will be sharing the links to all of these uh, lessons with you at the end of this session and in the follow-up email. Now I'm actually going to turn it back over to Dr. Klein to talk about our next early literacy strategy. The old Zoom trick, remember to unmute. Yes. <laughs> yes. We have been talking about the, the first strategy, but I want to add a layer because of what Mia shared, is that we learned some of this in isolation but the application to context is really important. So the second idea is talking about having time to focus on isolation, but then having time to practice in context. And both of those are part of the work. So it's the idea of the memorable concept that I mentioned first, but the second one is relatable. You know children have favorite topics. I don't have to mention dinosaurs without everybody both smiling and groaning at the same time, because there likely is, regardless of where in the world, regardless of early age, regardless of what children are interested in, a bit of a fascination with dinosaurs. You may not know how to spell triceratops, but it's amazing how early children can say triceratops. So making it relatable is the second idea. And part of that is allowing for informational, real world, and then some opportunities to, to deal with story. So we don't just work with story and we don't just work with informational. We need to give both of them because kids will relate in different ways to different types of contexts. So when we take what we know in isolation to practice in context, it helps us deepen our understanding but also use it in a targeted way. Part of this again goes back to what children learn. And I know I can recite every one of the 47 phonics generalizations. So if you wanna talk later, that would be a very boring webinar. But at the same time, I can give a lively example like the KN where the K is silent only occurs 10 active times in the language of English and two more inactive uses. Now you can start saying, can you write down all the words that begin KN where the K is silent? Let's not go there because kids are going to try and say Kanak when they first see that word. So when I think about the kinds of things of my teaching for so many years with young children is the idea that we can focus, as Mia just said, and target and give opportunities to repeat. Repetition is not boring. For some children, choice with repetition, as I mentioned first, deepens understanding. So think about how many times you've tried something. Is it a dance? Is it baking bread? Is it using almond flour for the first time, which I'm trying to learn how to use better? And everything is coming out flat instead of rising. You can give me some tips in the chat. No, I've learned that you have to increase the volume. So many, many times I have my children the simplest practice is say it soft, then say it normal, say it loud. Whether you talk about the one hand voice, no one can hear you further than one hand away from your face, the two hand voice further away from your face, or the three hand. To the early learner, this is different because each one is different. Repetition and deepening understanding. So when we think about the foundation of phonics, it is what is our, phonics is our foundation. But as we said already, it's based on oral language and it needs some independent practice. And that has to be both in context and in isolation. So reciting the 10 most active KN words and then actually the two that are least often used, the 12 making the total. Should I learn that rule? That when KN is at the beginning of the word, the K is silent for 10 or 12 examples no, but I need to counter that example frequently as foundational in learning to read and learning to write. So the isolation doesn't help us as much 
as context and isolation together. I remember rainbow writing. You all remember rainbow writing. Write it again with another color on top. Write it again. I'm such a fan of multicolored pens. You should see my desk. I'm hiding it from you because I just loved it. But when I thought about rainbow writing, we know that many children don't find that their only way of learning letters, but isn't it a fun way to concept and build on top of each other or put them in the four corners of a page or have some kind of repetition, magnetic letters even as well, or the movable parts that Seesaw offers. Then write in different sizes and places. I've already mentioned this, but it's that isolation and context. So one of my kids came in to kindergarten a few years ago, it said, Miss Klein, Miss Klein. I said, what, why are you so excited? He said, I found the at home. And I'm going, wonderful. I wasn't pushing to go home and find the word the. We had learned the word the as a sight word, as a spelling sequence. And he was so thrilled to tell me, he actually found it. I said, where'd you find it? He said, on the refrigerator, there was a poster that was there and it had the word the in it. And I found it. I went on a the hunt. And I went, fabulous. And then different places and sizes, but also even the idea of passing the writing around. You know, can you do it again and again? It isn't just boredom by one child, but the game-like quality that takes it to context and then finds it on the refrigerator at home. What better example of context? So when we think about young children, we need to think about varying the sound and the format. Now I said see the same sound. We also have to see the same letter. We have to see the same formation. So saying the see the sound, again, making talk visible to many children that's seeing the sound, but we're also needing to know the letter. We need to know it rapidly. We need to know it in every variant form. We need to know it everywhere we see it in a word, beginning, middle, and end. All of that practice, spaced repetition, and in variant forms in context will deepen the memory trace. Mia. All right, thank you so much. So um, we wanna share another um, lesson with you that you can use with your students to apply the strategy that Dr. Klein was just talking about, um, that practice within isolation and in context. So Phenomenal Phonics is a brand new collection built to support phonics at the word level. Repeated correct practice really helps students master spelling patterns. With each lesson, students engage in various multidimensional activities and are tasked with sorting and blending and segmenting each group of words based on the featured sound, allowing for that application and practice that Dr. Klein talked about, but while using the tools only Seesaw can offer. Uh, children can listen to words, they can use the microphone to the record and listen to their own voices and get information to support and build that independence throughout the lesson. We actually work very closely with Dr. Klein to create this collection um, that meets the needs of, of students in the classroom. And um, this is supplemental to that phonics instruction and gives that isolated practice to support uh, that small group guided reading and phonics instruction that you are doing in your classroom. So we're I'm going to actually jump in again to a phenomenal phonics lesson for the C sound. So each phenomenal phonics board practices the sound spelling through an introduction video, just similar to the one that you saw in that fun phonemes lesson with a light phonemic awareness warm up um, and song. So um, students begin here, and I'm just going to play a little bit of that song for you. <laughs> So very catchy. 
So after students uh, watch that video where with that phonemic awareness and that song that reiterates the sound, then they navigate throughout the various learn activities. Um, it, those activities include reading. Um, so they're reading the words, they're sorting the words, uh, they're blending the words as you can see here. They're segmenting the words. These um, activities were designed to be creative and to be hands on, but they're practicing the skills in the context of how those sounds are used together. Like you saw in fun phonemes, these activities end with a connect activity and um, a connect activity. And in this one, they get to play a game with a family member or a friend to find real life examples um, and really reflect on um, everything they learned about that letter C sound. So that's going back to making the learning meaningful and relatable. Um, Fun Fun Names was created to work just like the other lesson that I showed you over the course of several days. So students revisit and they complete a portion of this lesson over multiple days. This can be done in the classroom um, as a part of small group instruction for independent practice. Um, students can use these lessons in a center or a station, or you can assign them for um, remote learning or as a homework assignment as well. But all of these activities um, that students engage in work with minimal to no materials and can be done, like I mentioned before, in any environment. And we will be sharing um, these lessons with you at the end of the um, today's session, we have three lessons um, that aren't even published yet. So you guys have access to them early. Um, so we will share that in the participant handout as well as the follow-up email. All right, so I am going to turn it back to Dr. Klein for strategy number three. Well, I'm gonna start with just commenting on a question and a couple of comments that I noticed as Mia was sharing. And one of the things that happens is any one activity, and I'm going to call it an activity, isn't strategic by itself. The concept here is multiple repetitions in so many different ways. And when we consider whatever it was that you might have tried, the issue was, did you keep it in isolation or did you take it into context? And it is that kind, sometimes in isolation, it doesn't have enough meaning. Sometimes in isolation, it doesn't seem real. Why am I doing this? Even young children will ask, why am I doing this? And sometimes they are not receptive. I have a lot of children who have, I want to say, because um, second French was my second language. It's the language that we had in our schools starting in kindergarten and growing up, and then added languages after that. I'm a fan and a student of language. I, want to just live long enough to add some more languages. I know that sounds like a strange geeky goal, but when I think about what I needed to do in drill and practice, the longer it stayed isolated, the less interesting it was to me as a young child. But if I could take it to a song, to drawing, to labeling, to retelling, to again back to using language, tying it to this third idea, it is the idea that it isn't about drudgery. I'm not talking about drudgery at all. I'm talking about in isolation without application, doesn't make it memorable, doesn't make it owned by the child and doesn't make it encourage participation. So I was a child who didn't like to talk. I know that sounds funny right now, but I was the quietest one in the classroom. And therefore when we did some talking activities, in, in, in English or French, and then in New Mexico and Spanish, the kinds of things that we were working with didn't allow me to apply it. And the strongest application for memory trace with young children is also the idea of drawing, labeling, retelling, not just again, one and done, or not just here's what your center has in it. So the strategy is to use language and talk to draw, to label, to retell. Now, young children will come to us with a drawing and some scribbles. And as drawing and scribbles, they say, I wrote a letter to grandma. We're not talking about it being a letter to grandma in a negative sense. 
We're not talking about it being a letter to grandma in a challenging sense. You didn't write the capital. You didn't write that letter. You didn't do this. But this idea, wonderful, read it to me. Retell it to me. So inviting them in from any one of these opportunities to take it further is critically important to be the, the companion to what we've been talking about. Learning in isolation, taking it to talk, repeatable long-term memory, because in the long run, if we have word work, reading, and writing, they strengthen and reinforce all learning. Someone said, there was an old um, cartoon that said, uh, I taught him, one child talking to another about their dog, I taught him that word, but I don't hear him using it. I said I taught him, I didn't say he learned it. Now, I hope you can envision the cartoon I'm talking about. But the idea is even children recognize that when they take it to meaningful context, then it strengthens and reinforces their own efficacy, their own agency, their own motivation. So all of these words are about coming back to long-term memory. They need some reinforcement. Drawing and labeling, I'm thinking of Mary Ellen Giacobbe and several others who've written about how drawing, labeling, and retelling uh, reinforce and develop long-term memory. So children make up stories about letters because they might've heard a song. They'll make up their own version of the song and you'll laugh and giggle and not say, no, you didn't sing it right. You'll just laugh and giggle their approximation. We're trying to honor the approximation as children hone and develop their skills that go to long-term memory. So talk, drawing, labeling, retelling, long-term memory often doesn't get considered in early learning. It's just the Tuesday letter of the week, the Friday color of the week. We've got to build more depth and repetition and reinforcement and experience and joy into everything we're doing. So I give three examples from the classroom as we pull this together. But the idea that even though my examples may not have been the one that fit for you, to allow children to talk while they draw is something I'm gonna suggest you revisit in any language. So when I think about the idea of some children approach letters as drawing, many young children do, then they refine the form of the letter making if they're talking about it while they're drawing, they actually are building language in their head to go to long-term memory, to be memorable. So I think I started with one point related to this. I know I did, but I'm coming back to it. Talk in the classroom while labeling and drawing and writing is critically helpful to the child's own building of a memory trace. We do acting and drama from the very beginning, acting it out. And by the way, on apps and in other devices, seeing playful characters acting it out is a form of role-playing with children. And then technology. I've been a big fan and part of implementing technology since I had an, oh, I hate to say it, 19, well, this almost sounds weird because of the year 1984 when we started the implementation of the California Technology Project. And so much of that technology was four pieces of software, exploring language. Now look at where we are. This is an opportunity. This is learning together. This is growing together. And the student generated formats, my granddaughter told me how to change my wallpaper on my phone the other day to the color I wanted from the color I had. So technology they're growing up with. I don't wanna think about digital native versus digital not native, but I'm thinking in terms of how much it has changed in the years I've been teaching since we first started in technology. It's a tool, it's not the learning, it's a tool and we need powerful tools. So our goal is to use language in all form and to me, technology is a language. I won't even go to what I did when I was learning basic. We won't go there. But language in all forms, drama, reading, drawing, writing. I don't read slides to you, but these words are just too important to use them as language 
in all forms for our learning. And technology uses language in a way that has grown so beautifully. That's what we're talking about. All right. So our final set of Seesaw lessons that we wanna share with you come from our ELA Blackboards collection. Blackboards encourage students to use language in all forms like Dr. Klein was just talking about. So they ask a guiding question that students explore in multi-dimensional ways. So by writing, through drawing, with movement, um, by acting it out, um, cross-curricularly at home and at school, which sparks connections in the brains and reinforces learning. So we're gonna take a closer look at how a Blackboard supports early literacy development by using that language, that talking, that drawing, that labeling, and that retelling that Dr. Klein was talking about. So I'm gonna just pop right in to a kindergarten Blackboard called How Can I Tell a Familiar Story? So like with all of the other lessons that we shared, our Blackboard also starts with an instructional video where Rainbow Rainbow Bear, um, where Rainbow Bear um, talks about, teaches students in Turtle, his friend, how uh, to retell a familiar story. So I'm just going to play just a quick snippet of this. And sing. All right, well, great job. Sorry about that. Everyone, now that the wolf has run away, let's have the three pigs pack up to leave their mother's home. Hey, Rainbow Bear. Oh, hey, Turtle. You directing a movie? Oh, yeah. I'm directing the three little pigs. And I just filmed the scene where the wolf runs away and leaves them alone forever. <gasps> awesome. So you just filmed the last part of the story. Uh, you must be finished. Oh, well, actually, no. I'm about to start filming the beginning now. Please take your seat over there. I need to focus. Wait, wait, wait. You're just filming the beginning now? But yeah. I just heard you say the wolf ran away and leaves him alone forever. Uh-huh. Doesn't that happen at the end of the story? Shh. The beginning is important. But the whole story is important, Rainbow Bear. <laughs> So that's just a little snippet of that instructional video that kicks off this lesson. After students watch that, then they can click that arrow there. That's going to just take them back to that home page. And um, here on the home page, students are going to um, be completing several activities over the course of multiple days um, that allows them to practice retelling a familiar story. Um, so let's take a look at this activity here where students have the opportunity to act it out. So Dr. Klein was talking about acting out in drama. So they have a video here that they're gonna watch of a person using toys, retelling, telling um, a story, the toys are their characters, and then they're going to go to this follow-up activity. They get to find three toys or objects to help them retell the story of the three little pigs. They're gonna line those up and they're gonna use that camera feature. There's that technology within Seesaw to retell that story. So there are multiple activities that they go through over the course of multiple days. They do have the um, access to that draft feature. So someone at that question again. So they can complete one activity, they can click draft, they can save that activity in Seesaw and they can come back to that activity. And then when they're done over um, the course of several days and they'll click that green check mark to submit that um, activity. But they're going to be drawing, they're going to be um, writing, they're going to be reading um, and they're going to be um, using language in all forms just like uh, Dr. Klein mentioned. And this lesson does have a reflection activity, um, which um, students use to kind of reflect and self-assess on how they did. So we do have three Blackboard lessons that we will be sharing with you. And as we said before, we'll share the links to all of these resources at the end of the session um, in one handy dandy participant handout so you don't have to look several places for it. And it will also be included in the follow-up email. So to wrap up, we're going to turn it back over to Dr. Klein to um, reflect on the three ways that um, she discussed today in supporting early literacy in the classroom. Thank you, Mia. I think part of the challenge you just gave me is how my children will try to tell jokes and then they giggle hysterically. 
but they haven't really told a joke. It's just their attempt to tell a joke. And as former kindergarten teacher, I know you know, if I hear one more joke <laughs> that isn't a joke, but I still smile, but not disingenuously, truly, just as this early attempt in learning. And I heard someone use the acronym FAIL, F-A-I-L, for first attempt in learning. But one and done, what I said very early, is a need for repetition, not we finish that one, we'll go on. I love the beauty of the opportunity to repeat and to say the same joke again and to laugh hysterically again, all over again, as I watch my twin great nephews growing up who've just turned five, they will tell each other jokes over and over again, fall down laughing, and then get up and start again. So my niece, who is a teacher, has been sending me videos of her twin boys. And I've just been learning with them since they were about 18 months old through the video she's been sharing. I've been watching them carefully. And repetition seems so part of what they get joy from, so part of what they get reassurance from. So that's that first idea that we shared. The second one is the possibility of taking things in isolation, which is necessary. We have to shine a magnifying glass, or in some cases, I like to think of it as a spotlight or a flashlight on something. And then we take it to context again, pull it out of context, return it to context to make it memorable. And so there's so many researchers I could quote or cite. I mentioned just a few today, but the ones who truly, truly know young children understand this need for both, for speaking and listening, for reading and writing, for drawing and learning, and keeping that flexible and interchangeable. And that to make it memorable, they have to participate. They aren't just recipients. They aren't these empty vessels we're filling. We all know that image, but they are learning together. As I watched these twin nephews now at five, I watched how they've participated, been partners in the learning, made it theirs, and then try to teach each other. I've even tried to see them help each other read a page together, sitting in one chair, squeezed together, and they're sharing the learning. And that's part of the joy. And then thirdly, everything we've talked about today has been about language. The role of that early oral language foundation, taking talk to reading and drawing and labeling and writing, and not always in that order. As I said, young children may often think they're writers by drawing a picture and making some scribbles say, will you please mail this letter for me before they think they're readers. And so giving them more opportunities to draw, label and write actually and talk reinforces the reading instruction. It's all these intersecting circles. So here are summary points to think about as we, our quick hour comes to a close. And just repeating that faster is helping the fluency. And this is about the idea that fluency is developed with repetition. And then see the same sound in many places, in many different forms, adds the flexibility. So fluency, flexibility. And then I wanna add the third one, fun. So we're talking and I'm using three sounds, the fluency, the flexibility, and the fun, because to me, all of that comes together when we use language and get their enjoyment in learning. We're building the joy and giving them the opportunity. So thank you for the opportunity to share today. And I have a quote I like to always say that one and two may not be the right numbers for a webinar, but when one teaches to learn and your chat and your comments and your questions have helped me learn today. So thank you for both being a teacher and a learner today. Yes, Dr. Klein here is um, Dr. Klein's. If you want to follow her on Twitter, please go ahead and do that because um, there's more that um, you can learn from her as we continue. I agree with you. Yes, when uh, we all learn together, there were some great posts in the chat, great questions that came in as well. Um, really loved being here with all of you. So thank you so much, Dr. Klein. Um, we appreciate you spending the time with us to share those three strategies 
these three strategies that can be incorporated into classrooms to support early literacy starting tomorrow. Um, your wealth of knowledge. And as promised, here is the handout for you all. I'm just going to post it in the chat for you all. Um, so this handout here, it goes over, it has those three strategies there. It has the links to all of those lessons. We really encourage you to take some time to look at those lessons, see how you can use them, look at those strategies um, and see how you can support them in your classroom. If you have any further questions, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A right now. Um, and we'll get to a couple of them. Uh, I think Adria, one question that kind of came in, um, we had a few people bring this up. Do you have any other advice on how to support students right now who maybe have not recovered from the pandemic and just need a little extra support? So any, from, from your perspective, any feedback or support that you have? I'm thinking in terms of the one thing we don't consider, but it was in the list of the three, the opportunity to write and draw. For children who've had limited time in school, are been in reduced schedule, probably the thing that we've seen the most is lack of time for self-expression. And therefore, it isn't only the gaps in the reading knowledge, it's also the gaps in the expression that allows that to deepen understanding. So even as tough as it is, finding a way around this beautiful globe of ours to write, to communicate, to draw is not playtime. Yeah. It's serious work time for the brain. And it is never only about reading. It's about all of these areas. It's about literacy learning. And literacy learning is complex. And if we reduce it too small, we won't see the catch-up gains that we want from this time of limited opportunity. So all I want to suggest is the one thing kids didn't get to do when learning was put at a distance was truly write and express themselves. It's got to come back and technology is our friend for that kind of retelling, joke telling, writing about, labeling about. I didn't go to third because I just listed it as third in importance. I listed it because it's critical to round out a full literacy life. Fantastic. I feel like that that's great advice for us to, you know, we only have three minutes left. We um, got to most of the questions and other questions. We will make sure that we go ahead and get you an answer to those. So our goal for you is we would love for you to try one literacy lesson in your classroom in the next seven days. We would love to have you share with us how that lesson went. Um, you can use the social media hashtag Seesaw or Seesaw Lessons to share this with us. Um, or um, you can also tag Adria and them and she would love to see how you're using them in your classroom as well. We would love your feedback as well. Uh, so we'll go ahead and post in the chat a link to gather the feedback. I'm just gonna grab that really very quickly. There we go, it's in there already, fantastic. Um, we, we appreciate your feedback so much. Uh, we would love to know what you thought of this session. So please take just a moment to give us feedback in that um, uh, link right there. And if you are interested in more information, I know there were a ton of questions also posted about Seesaw Lessons. Go ahead and check out that web.seesaw.me forward slash lessons page. And um, there's tons of information there. And there's also places that you can connect with one of us at Seesaw to ask more of your questions. We so appreciate all of you joining us today. We know that it's busy and it's hard to uh, spend an extra hour in your day learning, but we really appreciate it. We also hope that um, this time has been useful for you and you can go back to your classroom feeling like you have some new strategies to use to support early literacy in your class. And Dr. Klein, we just so appreciate you being here with us. So thank you so much and uh, we hope to continue learning with you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much.